Good evening and welcome back to Book for the Night. I'm Melissa Phillips and tonight I'm reading chapters 15 and 16 of East of Eden by John Steinbeck. Enjoy. Chapter 15 Adam sat like a contented cat on his land. From the entrance to the little draw under a giant oak, which dipped its roots into underground water, he could look out over the acres lying away to the river and across to an alluvial flat and then up the rounded foothills on the western side. It was a fair place even in the summer when the sun laced into it. A line of river willows and sycamores banded it in the middle, and the western hills were yellow-brown with feed. For some reason, the mountains to the west of the Salinas Valley have a thicker skin of earth on them than have the eastern foothills, so that the grass is richer there. Perhaps the peaks store rain and distribute it, distribute it more evenly, and perhaps, be, being more wooded, they draw more rainfall. Very little of the Sanchez, now Trask place, was under cultivation, but Adam in his mind could see the wheat growing tall in squares of green alfalfa near the river. Behind him, he could hear the rackety hammering of the carpenters brought all the way from Salinas to rebuild the old Sanchez house. Adam had decided to live in the old house. Here was a place in which to plant his dynasty. The manure was scraped out, the old floors torn up, neck rubbed window casings ripped away. New sweet wood was going in, pine sharp with resin and velvety redwood and a new roof of long split shakes. The old thick walls sucked in coat after coat of whitewash made with lime and salt water, which, as it dried, seemed to have a luminosity of its own. He planned a permanent seat. A gardener had trimmed the ancient roses, planted geraniums, laid out the vegetable flats, and brought the living spring in little channels to wander back and forth through the garden. Adam forested comfort for himself and his descendant. In a shed, covered with tarpaulins, lay the crated heavy furniture sent from San Francisco and carted out from King City. He would have a good living, too. Lee, his pigtailed Chinese cook, had made a special trip to Pajarajo to buy the pots and kettles and pans, kegs, jars, copper, and glass for his kitchen. A new pigsty was building far from the house and downwind, with chicken and duck runs near and a kennel for the dogs to keep the coyotes away. It was no quick thing, Adam contemplated, to be finished and ready in a hurry. His men worked deliberately and slowly. It was a long job. Adam wanted it. Well done. He inspected every wooden joint, stood off to study paint samples on a shingle. In the corner of his room, catalogs piled up. Catalogs for machinery, furnishings, seeds, fruit trees. He was glad now that his father had left him a rich man. In his mind, a darkness was settling over his memory of Connecticut. Perhaps the hard flat light of the West was blotting out his birthplace. When he thought back to his father's house, to the farm, the town, to his brother's face, there was a blackness over all of it, and he shook off the memories. Temporarily, he had moved Kathy into the white-painted, clean spare house of Bardoni, there to await the home and the child. There was no doubt, whatever, that the child would be finished well before the house was ready, but Adam was unhurried. I want it built strong, he directed over and over. I want it to last. Copper nails and hard wood. Nothing to rust and rot. He was not alone in his preoccupation with the future. The whole valley, the whole west, was that way. It was a time when the past had lost its sweetness and its sap. You'd go a long good road before you find a man, and he very old, who wished to bring back a golden past. Men were notched and comfortable in the present, hard and unfruitful as it was, but only as a doorstep into a fantastic future. Rarely did two men meet, or three stand in a bar, or a dozen gnaw tough venison in camp, that the valley's future, paralyzing in its grandeur, did not come up, not as conjecture, but as a certainty. It'll be... Who knows? Maybe in our lifetime, they said. And people found happiness in the future according to their present lack. Thus a man might bring his family down from a hill ranch in a drag, a big box nailed on oaken runners which pumped, which pulled bumping down the broken hills. In the straw of the box, his wife would brace the children against the tooth-shattering, tongue-biting crash of the runners against stone and ground. And the father would set his heels and think, when the roads come in, then will be the time 
Why, we'll sit high and happy in a Surrey and get clear into King City in three hours. And what more in the world could you want than that? Or let a man survey his grove of live oak trees, hard as coal and hotter, the best firewood in the world. In his pocket might be a newspaper with a squib. Oak cord wood is bringing $10 a cord in Los Angeles. Why, hell, when the railroads put a branch out here, I could lay it down neat, broke up and seasoned, right beside the track for a dollar and a half a cord. Let's go whole hog and say the Southern Pacific will charge three fifty to carry it. There's still five dollars a cord, and there's three thousand cords in that little grove alone. That's fifteen thousand dollars right there. There were others who prophesied, with rays shining on their forehead, about the sometime ditches that would carry water all over the valley. Who knows, maybe in our lifetime, or deep wells with steam and with steam engines to pump the water out of the guts of the world. Can you imagine? Just think what this land would raise with plenty of water. Why, it would be a friggin' garden. Another man, may he was crazy, said that someday there'd be a way, maybe ice, maybe some other way, to get a peach like this here I got in my hand clear to Philadelphia. In the towns they talked of sewers and inside toilets, and some already had them, and arc lights on the street corners, Salinas had those, and telephones. There wasn't any limit, no boundary at all to the future, and it would be so a man wouldn't have room to store his happiness. Contentment would flood raging down the valley like the Salinas River in March of a 30-inch year. They looked over the flat, dry, dusty valley and the ugly mushroom towns, and they saw a loveliness. Who knows? Maybe in our lifetime. That's one reason you couldn't laugh too much at Samuel Hamilton. He let his mind range more deliciously than any other, and it didn't sound so silly when you heard what they were doing in San Jose. Where Samuel went haywire was wondering whether people would be happy when all that came. Happy? He's haywire now. Just let us get it and we'll show you happiness. And Samuel could remember hearing of a cousin of his mother's in Ireland, a knight and a rich and handsome, and anyway shot himself on a silken couch sitting beside the most beautiful woman in the world who loved him. There's a capacity for appetite, Samuel said, that a whole heaven and earth of cake can't satisfy. Adam Trask knows some of his happiness into futures, but there was present contentment in him too. He felt his heart smack up against his throat when he saw Kathy sitting in the sun, quiet, her baby growing, and a transparency to her skin that made him think of the angels on Sunday school cards. Then a breeze would move her bright hair, or she would raise her eyes, and Adam would swell out in his stomach with a pressure of ecstasy that was close kin to grief. If Adam rested like a sleek-fed cat on his land, Kathy was cat-like too. She had the inhuman attribute of abandoning what she could not get and of waiting for what she could get. These two gifts gave her great advantages. Her pregnancy had been an accident. When her attempt to abort herself failed and the doctor threatened her, she gave up that method. This does not mean that she reconciled herself to pregnancy. She sat it out as she would have weathered an illness. Her marriage to Adam had been the same. She was trapped and she took the best possible way out. She had not wanted to go to California either, but other plans were denied her for the time being. As a very young child, she had learned to win by using the momentum of her opponent. It was easy to guide a man's strength where it was impossible to resist him. Very few people in the world could have known that Kathy did not want to be where she was and in the condition she was. She relaxed and waited for the change she knew must come sometime. Kathy had the one quality required of a great and successful criminal. She trusted no one, confided in no one. Herself was an island. It is probable that she did not even look at Adam's new land or building house or turn his towering plans to reality in her mind because she not did not intend to live here after her sickness was over, after her trap opened. But to his questions, she gave proper answers. To do otherwise would be waste motion and dissipated energy and foreign to a good cat. See, my darling, how the house lies, windows looking down the valley. It's beautiful. You know, it may sound foolish, but I find myself trying to think the way old Sanchez did a hundred years ago. How was the valley then? He must have planned so carefully. You know, he had pipes. He did, made out of redwood with a hole bored or burned through to carry the water down from the spring. 
we dug up some pieces of it. That's remarkable, she said. He must have been clever. I'd like to know more about him. From the way the house sets, the trees he left, the shape and proportion of the house, he must have been a kind of artist. He was a Spaniard, wasn't he? They're artistic people, I've heard. I remember in school about a painter. No, he was Greek. I wonder where I could find out about old, old Sanchez. Well, someone must know. All of his work and planning, and Bardoni kept cows in the house. You know what I wonder about most? What, Adam? I wonder if he had a Kathy and who she was. She smiled and looked down and away from him. The things you say. He must have had. He must have had. I never had energy or direction or, well, even a very great desire to live before I had you. Adam, you embarrass me. Adam, be careful. Don't joggle me. It hurts. I'm sorry. I'm so clumsy. No, you're not. You just don't think. Should I be knitting or sewing, do you suppose? I'm so comfortable just sitting. We'll buy everything we need. You just sit and be comfortable. I guess in a way you're working harder than anyone here. But the pay? The pay is wonderful. Adam, the scar on my forehead isn't going to go away, I'm afraid. The doctor said it would fade in time. Well, sometimes it seems to be getting fainter, and then it comes back. Don't you think it's darker today? No, I don't. But it was. It looked like a huge thumbprint, even to whirls of wrinkled skin. He put his finger near, and she drew her head away. Don't, she said. It's tender to the touch. It turns red if you touch it. It will go away. Just takes a little time, that's all. She smiled as he turned, but when he walked away, her eyes were flat and directionless. She shifted her body restlessly. The baby was kicking. She relaxed and all her muscles loosened. She waited. Lee came near where her chair was set under the biggest oak tree. Missy, like E.T.? No. Yes, I would, too. Her eyes inspected him, and her inspection could not penetrate the dark brown of his eyes. He made her uneasy. Kathy had always been able to shovel into the mind of any man and dig up his impulses and his, and his desires. But Lee's brain gave and repelled like rubber. His face was lean and pleasant, his forehead broad, firm, and sensitive, and his lips curled in a perpetual smile. His long, black, glossy braided cue tied at the bottom with a narrow piece of black silk, hung over his shoulder and moved rhythmically against his chest. When he did violent work, he curled his cue on top of his head. He wore narrow cotton trousers, black heelless slippers, and a frogged Chinese smock. Whenever he could, he hid his hands in his sleeves as though he were afraid for them, as most Chinese did in that day. I bling little table, he said, bowed slightly, and shuffled away. Kathy looked after him, and her eyebrows drew down in a scowl. She was not afraid of Lee, yet she was not comfortable with him either. But he was a good and respectful servant, the best. And what harm could he do her? The summer progressed, and the Salinas River retired underground or stood in green pools under high banks. The cattle lay drowsing all day long under the willows and only moved out at night to feed. An umber tone came to the grass and the afternoon winds blowing inevitably down the valley started a dust that was like fog and raised it into the sky almost as high as the mountaintops. The wild oat roots stood up where the winds blew the earth away. Along a polished earth, pieces of straw and twigs scampered until they were stopped by some rooted thing, and little stones rolled crookedly before the wind. It became more apparent than ever why old Sanchez had built his house in the little draw, for the wind and the dust did not penetrate, and the spring, while it diminished, still gushed ahead of cold, clear water. But Adam, looking out over his dry, dust-obscured land, felt the panic the eastern man always does at first in California. In a Connecticut summer, two weeks without rain is a dry spell and four a drought. If the countryside is not green, it is dying. But in California, it does not ordinarily rain at all between the end of May and the first of November. The eastern man, though he has been told, feels the earth is sick in the rainless months. 
Adam sent Lee with a note to the Hamilton place to ask Samuel to visit him and discuss the boring of some wells on his new place. Samuel was sitting in the shade watching his son Tom design and build a revolutionary coon trap when Lee drove up in the Trask cart. Lee folded his hands in his sleeves and waited. Samuel read the note. Tom, he said, do you think you could help the estate going while I run down and talk water with a dry man? Why don't I go with you? You might need some help. At talking? That I don't. It won't come to digging for some time if I'm any judge. With wells, there's got to be a great deal of talk. Five or six hundred words for every shovel of dirt. I'd like to go. It's Mr. Trask, isn't it? I didn't meet him when he came here. You'll do that when the digging starts. I'm older than you. I've got first claim on the talk. You know, Tom, a coon is going to reach his pretty little hand through here and let himself out. You know how clever they are. See this piece here? It screws on and turns down here. You couldn't get out of that yourself. I'm not so clever as a coon. I think you've worked it out, though. Tom, boy, would you saddle Dexology while I go tell your mother where I'm going? I bling lig, said Lee. Well, I have to come home sometime. I bling back. Nonsense, said Samuel. I'll lead my horse in and ride back. Samuel sat in the buggy beside Lee, and his clobber-footed saddle horse shuffled clumsily behind. What's your name? Samuel asked pleasantly. Lee. Got more name. Lee Papa family name. Call Lee. I've read quite a lot about China. You born in China? No, born here. Samuel was silent for quite a long time while the buggy lurched down the wheel track toward the dusty valley. Lee, he said at last, I mean no disrespect, but I've never been able to figure out why you people still talk pigeon when an illiterate baboon from the black bogs of Ireland, with a head full of Gaelic and a tongue like a potato, learns to talk a poor grade of English in ten years. Lee grinned. Me talky Chinese talk, he said. Well, I guess you have your reasons, and it's not my affair. I hope you'll forgive me if I don't believe it, Lee. Lee looked at him, and the brown eyes under their rounded upper lids seemed to open and deepen until they weren't foreign anymore, but man's eyes, warm with understanding. Lee chuckled. It's more than a convenience, he said. It's even more than self-protection. Mostly we have to use it to be understood at all. Samuel showed no sign of having observed any change. I can understand the first two, he said thoughtfully, but the third escapes me. Lee said, I know it's hard to believe, but it has happened so often to me and to my friends that we take it for granted. If I should go up to a lady or gentleman, for instance, and speak as I am doing now, I wouldn't be understood. Why not? Pigeon they expect, and pigeon they'll listen to. But English from me they don't listen to, and so they don't understand it. Can that be possible? How do I understand you? That's why I'm talking to you. You are one of the rare people who can separate your observation from your preconception. You see what it is, where most people see what they expect. I hadn't thought of it, and I've not been so tested as you, but what you say has a candle of truth. You know, I'm very glad to talk to you. I've wanted to ask so many questions. Happy, happy to oblige. So many questions. For instance, you wear the queue. I've read that it is a badge of slavery imposed by conquest by the Manchus on the southern Chinese. That is true. Then why in the name of God do you wear it here, where the Manchus can't get at you? Talky Chinese talk. Queue Chinese fashion. You savvy? Samuel laughed loudly. That does have the green touch of convenience, he said. I wish I had a hidey hole like that. I'm wondering whether I can explain, said Lee, where there is no likeness of experience, very difficult. I understand you were not born in America. No, in Ireland. And in a few years you can almost disappear, while I, who was born in Grass Valley, went to school in several years to the University of California, have no chance of mixing. If you cut your cue, dressed and talked like other people? Nope, I tried it. To the so-called whites, I was still a Chinese, but an untrustworthy one, and at the same time my Chinese friends steered clear of me. I had to give it up. 
Lee pulled up under a tree, got out, and unfastened the check rein. Time for lunch, he said. I made a package. Would you like some? Sure I would. Let me get down in the shade there. I forget to eat sometimes, and that's strange because I'm always hungry. I'm interested in what you say. It has a sweet sound of authority. Now it peeks into my mind that you should go back to China. Lee smiled satirically at him. In a few minutes, I don't think you'll find a loose bar I've missed in a lifetime of search. I did go back to China. My father was a fairly successful man. It didn't work. They said I looked like a foreign devil. They said I spoke like a foreign devil. I made mistakes in manners, and I didn't know delicacies that had grown up since my father left. They wouldn't have me. You can believe it or not. I'm less foreign here than I was in China. I'll have you to believe you because it's reasonable. You've given me things to think about until at least February 27th. Do you mind my questions? As a matter of fact, no. The trouble with pigeon is that you get to thinking in pigeon. I write a great deal to keep my English up. Hearing and reading aren't the same as speaking and writing. Don't you ever make a mistake? I mean, break into English? No, I don't. I think it's a matter of what is expected. You look in a man's eyes, you see that he expects pigeon and a shuffle, so you pe speak pigeon and shuffle. I guess that's right, said Samuel. In my own way, I tell jokes because people come all the way to my place to laugh. I try to be funny for them even when the sadness is on me. But the Irish are said to be a happy people, full of jokes. There's your pigeon and your cue. They're not. There are dark people with a gift for suffering way past their deserving. It's said that without whiskey to soak and soften the world, they'd kill themselves. But they tell jokes because it's, it's expected of them. Leon wrapped a little bottle. Would you like some of this? Chinese drink? What is it? Chinese blandy. Stong drink. As a matter of fact, it's a brandy with a dosage of wormwood. Very powerful. It softens the world. Samuel sipped from the bottle. Tastes a little like rotten apples, he said. Yes, but nice rotten apples. Taste it back along your, along your tongue toward the roots. Samuel took a big swallow and tilted his head back. I see what you mean. That is good. Here are some sandwiches, pickles, cheese, a can of buttermilk. You do well. Yes, I see to it. Samuel bit into a sandwich. I was shuffling over half a hundred questions. What you said brings the brightest one up. You don't mind. Not at all. The only thing I do want to ask of you is to not talk this way when other people are listening. It would only confuse them and they wouldn't believe it anyway. I'll try, said Samuel. If I slip, just remember that I'm a comical genius. It's hard to split a man down the middle and always reach for the same half. I think I can guess what your next question is. What? Why am I content to be a servant? How in the world did you know? It seemed to follow. Do you resent the question? Not from you. There are no ugly questions except those clothed in condescension. I don't know where being a servant came into dis disrepute. It is the refuge of a philosopher, the food of the lazy, and, properly carried out, it is a position of power, even of love. I can't understand why more intelligent people don't take it as a career. Learn to do it well and reap its benefits. A good servant has absolute security, not because of his master's kindness, but because of habit and, and indolence. It's a hard thing for a man to change spices or lay out his own socks. He'll keep a bad servant rather than change. But a good servant, and I am an excellent one, can completely control his master, tell him what to think, how to act, whom to marry, when to divorce, reduce him to terror as a discipline, or distribute happiness to him, and finally be mentioned in his will. If I had wished, I could have robbed, stripped, and beaten any one I've worked for and come away with thanks. Finally, in my circumstances, I am unprotected. My master will defend me, protect me. You have to work and worry. I work less and worry less, and I am a good servant. A bad one does no work and does no worrying, and he still is fed, clothed, and protected. I don't know any profession where the field is so cluttered with incompetence and where excellence is so rare. Samuel leaned forward, listening intently. Lee went on. It's going to be a relief after that to go back to Pigeon. 
It's a very short distance to the Sanchez place. Why did we stop so near? Samuel asked. Ali time talkie, me Chinese number one boy, you let he go now? What? Oh, sure, but it must be a lonely life. That's the only fault with it, said Lee. I've been thinking of going to San Francisco and starting a little business. Like a laundry or a grocery store? No, too many Chinese laundries and restaurants. I thought perhaps a bookstore. I'd like that, and the competition wouldn't be too great. I probably won't do it, though. A servant loses his initiative. In the afternoon, Samuel and Adam rode over the land. The wind came up as it did every afternoon, and the yellow dust ran into the sky. Oh, it's a good piece, Samuel cried. It's a rare piece of land. Seems to me it's blowing away bit by bit, Adam observed. No, it's just moving over a little. You lose some to the James Ranch, but you get some from the Southies. Well, I don't like the wind. Makes me nervous. Nobody likes wind for very long. It makes animals nervous and restless, too. I don't know whether you've noticed, but a little farther up the valley, they're planting windbreaks of gum trees. Eucalyptus comes from Australia. They say the gums grow 10 feet a year. Why don't you try a few rows and see what happens? In time, they should pack up the wind a little, and they make grand firewood. Good idea, Adam said. What I really want is water. This wind would pump all the water I could find. I thought if I could bring in a few wells and irrigate, the topsoil wouldn't blow away. I might try some beans. Samuel squinted into the wind. I'll try to get you water if you want, he said. And I've got a little pump. I made that will bring, up, bring it up fast. It's my own invention. A windmill is a pretty costly thing. Maybe I could build them for you and save you some money. That's good, said Adam. I wouldn't mind the wind if it worked for me. And if I could get water, I might plant alfalfa. It's never brought much of a price. I wasn't thinking of that. A few weeks ago, I took a drive up around Greenfield and Gonzales. Some Swiss have moved in there. They've got nice little dairy herds, and they get four crops of alfalfa a year. I heard about them. They brought in Swiss cows. Adam's face was bright with plans. That's what I want to do. Sell butter and cheese and feed the milk to pigs. You're going to bring credit to the valley, Samuel said. You're going to be a real joy to the future. If I can get water. I'll get you water if there's any to be got. I'll find it. I brought my magic wand. He patted a fork stick tied to his saddle. Adam pointed to the left where a wide flat place was covered with a low growth of sagebrush. Now then, he said, 36 acres and almost level as a floor. I put an auger down. Topsoil averages three and a half feet. Stand on top and loam within re plow reach. Think you could get water there? I don't know, Samuel said. I'll see. He dismounted, handed his reins to Adam, and untied his forked wand. The, he took the forks in his two hands and walked slowly, his arms out and stretched before him and the wand tip up. His steps took a zigzag course. Once he frowned and backed up a few steps, then shook his head and went on. Adam rode slowly along behind, leading the other horse. Adam kept his eyes on the stick. He saw it quiver and then jerk a little, as though an invisible fish were tugging at a line. Samuel's face was taut with attention. He continued on until the point of the wand seemed to be pulled strongly downward against his straining arms. He made a slow circle, broke off a piece of sagebrush, and dropped it on the ground. He moved well outside his circle, held up his stick again, and moved inward toward his marker. As he came near it, the point of the stick was drawn down again. Samuel sighed and relaxed and dropped his wand on the ground. I can get water here, he said, and not very deep. The pull was strong. Plenty of water. Good, said Adam. I want to show you a couple more places. Samuel whittled out a stout piece of sagewood and drove it into the soil. He made a split on the top and fitted a cross piece on for a mark. Then he kicked the brittle brush down in the area so he could find his marker again. On a second try 300 yards away, the wand seemed nearly torn downward out of his hands. Now there's a whole world of water here, he said. The third try was not so productive. After half an hour, he had only the slightest sign. The two men rode slowly back toward the Trask house. 
The afternoon was golden, for the yellow dust in the sky gilded the light. As always, the wind began to drop as the day waned, but it sometimes took half the night for the dust to settle out of the air. I knew it was a good place, Samuel said. Anyone can see that, but I didn't know it was that good. You must have a great drain under your land from the mountains. You know how to pick land, Mr. Trask. Adam smiled. We had a farm in Connecticut, he said. For six generations, we dug stones out. One of the first things I remember is sledding stones over to the walls. I thought that was the way all farms were. It's strange to me and almost sinful here. If you wanted a stone, you'd have to go a long way for it. The ways of sin are curious, Samuel observed. I guess if a man had to shuck off everything he had, inside and out, he'd manage to hide a few little sins somewhere for his own discomfort. They're the last things we'll give up. Maybe that's a good thing to keep us humble, the fear of God in us. I guess so, said Samuel, and I guess humility must be a good thing since it's a rare man who is not a piece of it, but when you look at humbleness it's hard to see where its value rests unless you grant that it has been a pleasurable pain and very precious. Suffering, I wonder, has it been properly looked at? Tell me about your stick, Adam said. How does it work? Samuel stroked the fork now tied to his saddle strings. I don't really believe in it save that it works, he smiled at Adam. Maybe it's this way. Maybe I know where the water is. Feel it in my skin. Some people have a gift in this direction or that. Suppose, well, call it humility or a deep disbelief in myself, force me to do a magic to bring up to the surface the thing I know anyway. Does that make any sense to you? I'd have to think about it said Adam. The horses picked their own way, heads hung low, reins loosened against the bits. Can you stay the night? Adam asked. I can, but better not. I didn't tell Liza I'd be away the night. I'd not like to give her a worry. But she knows where you are. Sure, she knows, but I'll ride home tonight. It doesn't matter the time. If you'd like to ask me to supper, I'd be glad. And when do you want me to start on the wells? Now. As soon as you can. You know it's no cheap thing indulging yourself with water. I'll have to charge you 50 cents or more a foot, depending on what we find down there. It can run into money. I have the money. I want the wells. Look, Mr. Hamilton. Samuel would be easier. Look, Samuel. I mean to make a garden of my land. Remember my name is Adam. So far I've had no Eden, let alone been driven out. It's the best reason I ever heard for making a garden, Samuel exclaimed. He chuckled. Where will the orchard be? Adam said, I won't plant apples. That would be looking for accidents. And what does Eve say to that? She has a say, you remember. And Eve's delight in apples. Not this one, Adam's eyes were shining. You don't know this Eve. She'll celebrate my choice. I don't think anyone can know her goodness. You have a rarity. Right now, I can't recall any greater gift. They were coming near to the entrance to the little side valley in which was the Sanchez house. They could see the rounded green tops of the great live oaks. Gift, Adam said softly. You can't know. No one can know. I had a gray life, Mr. Hamilton, Samuel. Not that it was bad compared to other lives, but it was nothing. I don't know why I tell you this. Maybe because I like to hear. My mother died before my memory. My stepmother was a good woman, but troubled and ill. My father was a stern, fine man, maybe a great man. You couldn't love him? I had the kind of feeling you have in church, and not a little fear in it. Samuel nodded. I know, and some men want that. He smiled ruefully. I've always wanted the other. Liza says it's the weak thing in me. My father put me in the army, in the West, against the Indians. You told me, but you don't think like a military man. I wasn't a good one. I seem to be telling you everything. You must want to. There's always a reason. A soldier must want to do the things we had to do, or at least be satisfied with them. I couldn't find good enough reasons for killing men and women, nor understand the reasons when they were explained. They rode on in silence for a time. Adam went on. I came out of the army like dragging myself muddy out of a swamp. 
I wandered for a long time before going home to a remembered place that I did not love. Your father? He died, and home was a place to sit around or work around, waiting for death the way you might wait for a dreadful picnic. Alone? No, I have a brother. Where is he? Waiting for the picnic? Yes, yes, that's exactly what. Then Kathy came. Maybe I will tell you sometime when I can tell you, and you want to hear. I'll want to hear, Samuel said. I eat stories like grapes. A kind of light spread out from her, and everything changed color, and the world opened out, and a day was good to awaken to, and there were no limits to anything, and the people of the world were good and handsome, and I was not afraid any more. I recognize it, Samuel said. That's an old friend of mine. It never dies, but sometimes it moves away, or you do. Yes, that's my acquaintance. Eyes, nose, nose, mouth, and hair. All this coming out of a little hurt girl. And not out of you? Oh no, or it would have come or it would have come before. No, Kathy brought it, and it lives around her. And now I've told you why I want the wells. I have to repay somehow for value received. I'm going to make a garden so good, so beautiful, that it will be a proper place for her to live and a fitting place for her light to shine on. Samuel swallowed several times, and he spoke with a dry voice out of a pinched-out throat. I can see my duty, he said. I can see it plainly before me if I am any kind of man, any kind of friend to you. What do you mean? Samuel said satirically. It's my duty to take this thing of yours and kick it in the face, then raise it up and spread slime on it thick enough to blot out its dangerous light. His voice grew strong with vehemence. I should hold it up to your muck covered and show you its dirt and danger. I should warn you to look closer until you can see how ugly it really is. I should ask you to think of inconsistency and give you examples. I should give you Othello's handkerchief. Oh, I know I should, and I should straighten out your tangled thoughts, show you that the impulse is gray as lead and rotten as a dead cow in wet weather. If I did my duty well, I could give you back your old bad life and feel good about it and welcome you back to the musty membership in the lodge. Are, are you joking? Maybe I shouldn't have told. It is the duty of a friend. I have a friend who did the duty once for me, but I'm a false friend. I'll get no credit for it among my peers. It's a lovely thing. Preserve it and glory in it. And I'll dig your wells if I have to drive my rig to the black center of the earth. I'll squeeze water out like juice from an orange. They rode under the great oaks and toward the house. Adam said, There she is. Sitting outside, he shouted. Kathy, he says there's water. Lots of it. Aside, he said excitedly. Did you know she's going to have a baby? Even at this distance, she looks beautiful, Samuel said. Because the day had been hot, Lee set a table outside under an oak tree, and as the sun neared the western mountains, he padded back and forth from the kitchen, carrying the cold meats, pickles, potato salad, coconut cake, and peach pie, which were supper. In the center of the table, he placed a gigantic stoneware pitcher full of milk. Adam and Samuel came from the wash house, their hands and faces shining with water, and Samuel's beard was fluffy after its soaping. They stood at the trestle table and waited until Kathy came out. She walked slowly, picking her way as though she were afraid she would fall. Her full skirt and apron concealed to a certain extent her swelling abdomen. Her face was untroubled and childlike, and she clasped her hands in front of her. She had reached the table before she looked up and glanced from Samuel to Adam. Adam held her chair for her. "'You haven't met Mr. Hamilton, dear,' he said. She held out her hand. "'How do you do?' she said. Samuel had been inspecting her. "'It's a beautiful face,' he said. "'I'm glad to meet you. You are well, I hope.' "'Oh, yes, yes, I'm well.' The men sat down. "'She makes it formal whether she wants to or not. "'Every meal is a kind of occasion,' Adam said." Don't talk like that, she said. It isn't true. Doesn't it feel like a party to you, Samuel? He asked. It does so, and I can tell you there's never been such a candidate for a party as I am. And my children, they're worse. My boy Tom wanted to come today. He's spoiling to get off the ranch. Samuel suddenly realized that he was making his speech last to prevent silence from falling on the table. 
He paused and the silence dropped. Kathy looked down at her plate while she ate a sliver of roast lamb. She looked up as she put it between her small, sharp teeth. Her wide-set eyes communicated nothing. Samuel shivered. It isn't cold, is it? Adam asked. Cold? No, a goose walked over my grave, I guess. Oh, yes, I know that feeling. The silence fell again. Samuel waited for some speech to start up, knowing in advance that it would not. Do you like our valley, Mrs. Trask? What? Oh, yes. If it isn't impertinent to ask, when is your baby due? In about six weeks, Adam said. My wife is one of those paragons, a woman who does not talk very much. Sometimes the silence tells the most, said Samuel, and he saw Kathy's eyes leap up and down again, and it seemed to him that the scar on her forehead grew darker. Something had flicked her the way you'd flick a horse with a braided string popper on a buggy whip. Samuel couldn't recall what he had said that had made her give a small inward start. He felt a tenseness coming over him that was somewhat like the feeling he had just before the water wand pulled down, an awareness of something strange and strained. He glanced at Adam and saw that he was looking rapidly at his wife. Whatever was strange was not strange to Adam. His face had happiness on it. Kathy was chewing a piece of meat, chewing with her front teeth. Samuel had never seen anyone chew that way before, and when she had swallowed, her little tongue flicked around her lips. Samuel's mind repeated, Something, something, can't find what it is, something wrong, and the silence hung on the table. There was a shuffle behind him. He turned. Lee set a teapot on the table and shuffled away. Samuel began to talk to push the silence away. He told how he had first come to the valley fresh from Ireland, but within a few words, neither Kathy nor Adam was listening to him. To prove it, he used a trick he had devised to discover whether his children were listening when they begged him to read to them and would not let him stop. He threw in two sen sentences of nonsense. There was no response from either Adam or Kathy. He gave up. He bolted his supper, drank his tea scalding hot, and folded his napkin. Ma'am, if you'll excuse me, I'll ride off home, and I thank you for your hospitality. Good night, she said. Adam jumped to his feet. He seemed torn out of a reverie. Don't go now. I hope to persuade you to stay the night. No, thank you, but I can't, and it's not a long ride. I think, of course, I know, there'll be a moon. When will you start the wells? I'll have to get my rig together, do a piece of sharpening, and put my house in order. In a few days, I'll send the equipment with Tom. The life was flowing back into Adam. Make it soon, he said. I want it soon. Kathy, we're going to make the most beautiful place in the world. There'll be nothing like it anywhere. Samuel switched his gaze to Kathy's face. It did not change. The eyes were flat, and the mouth with its small upcurve at the corners was carven. That will be nice, she said. For just a moment, Samuel had an impulse to do or say something to shock her out of her distance. He shivered again. Another goose? Adam asked. Another goose. The dusk was falling, and already the tree forms were dark against the sky. Good night, then. I'll walk down with you. No. Stay with your wife. You haven't finished your supper. But I... Sit down, man. I can find my own horse, and if I can't, I'll steal one of yours. Samuel pushed Adam gently down in his chair. Good night, good night. Good night, ma'am. He walked quickly toward the shed. Old platterfoot doxology was daintily nibbling hay from the manger with lips like two flounders. The halter chain clinked against wood. Samuel lifted down his saddle from the big nail where it hung by one wooden stirrup and swung it over the broad back. He was lacing the latigo through the cinch rings when there was a small stir behind him. He turned and saw the silhouette of Lee against the last light from the open shadows. "'When you come back?' the Chinese asked softly. "'I don't know. In a few days or a week. Lee, what is it?' "'What is what? By God, I got creepy. Is there something wrong here?' What do you mean? You know damn well what I mean. Chinese boy just worky, not here, not talky. Yes, I guess you're right. Sure you're right. Sorry I asked you. It wasn't very good manners. 
He turned back, slipped the bit in Dox's mouth, and laced the big flop ears into the headstall. He slipped the halter and dropped it in the manger. Good night, Lee, he said. Mr. Hamilton? Yes. Do you need a cook? On my place, I can't afford a cook. I'd work cheap. Liza would kill you. Why? You want to quit? Just thought I'd ask, said Lee. Good night. Adam and Kathy sat in the gathering dark under the tree. He's a good man, Adam said. I like him. I wish I could persu cur I wish I could persuade him to take over here and run this place. Kind of superintendent. Kathy said, he's got his own place and his own family. Yes, I know, and it's the poorest land you ever saw. He could make more at wages from me. I'll ask him. It does take a time to get used to a new country. It's like being born again and having to learn all over. I used to know from what quarter the rains came. It's different here. And once I knew in my skin whether wind would blow, when it would be cold. But I'll learn. It just takes a little time. Are you comfortable, Kathy? Yes. One day, and not too far away, you'll see the whole valley green with alfalfa. See it from the fine big windows of the finished house. I'll plant rows of gum trees, and I'm going to send away for seeds and plants, put in a kind of experimental farm. I might try lychee nuts from China. I wonder if they would grow here. Well, I can try. Maybe Lee could tell me. And once the baby's born, you can ride over the whole place with me. You haven't really seen it. Did I tell you? Mr. Hamilton is going to put up windmills, and we'll be able to see them turning from here. He stretched his legs out comfortably under the table. Lee should bring candles, he said. I wonder what's keeping him. Kathy spoke very quietly. Adam, I did not want to come here. I am not going to stay here. As soon as I can, I will go away. Oh, nonsense, he laughed. You're like a child away from home for the first time. You'll love it once you get used to it and the baby is born. You know, when I first went away to the army, I thought I was going to die of homesickness, but I got over it. We all get over it. So don't say silly things like that. It's not a silly thing. Don't talk about it, dear. Everything will change after the baby is born. You'll see. You'll see. He clapped his hands behind his head and looked up at the faint stars through the tree branches. Chapter 16 Samuel Hamilton rode back home in a night so flooded with moonlight that the hills took on the quality of the white and dusty moon. The trees and earth were moon dry, silent and airless and dead. The shadows were black without shading and the open places white without color. Here and there Samuel could see secret movement, for the moon feeders were at work, the deer which browse all night when the moon is clear and sleep under thickets in the day, rabbits and field mice and all other small hunted that feel safer in the concealing light crept and hopped and crawled and froze to resemble stones or small bushes when ear or nose suspected danger. The predators were working too, the long weasels like waves of brown light, the cobby wildcats crouching near to the ground, almost invisible except when their yellow eyes caught light and flashed for a second. The foxes sniffling with pointed up raised noses for a warm-blooded supper, the raccoons padding near still water, talking frogs. The coyotes nuzzled along the slopes and, torn with sorrow joy, raised their heads and shouted their feeling, half keen, half laughter, at their goddess moon. And all over, all the shadowy screech owls sailed, drawing a smudge of shadowy fear below them on the ground. The wind of the afternoon was gone, and only a little breeze like a sigh was stirred by the restless thermals of the warm, dry hills. Doxology's loud, offbeat hoofsteps silenced the night people until after he had passed. Samuel's beard glinted white, and his graying hair stood up high on his head. He had hung his black hat on a saddle horn. An ache was at the top of his stomach, an apprehension that was like a sick thought. It was a Welsh smirts, which we used to call Welsh rats, the world's sad sadness that rises into the soul like a gas and spreads despair so that you probe for the offending event and can find none. Samuel went back in his mind over the fine ranch and the indications of water. No Welsh rats would come out of that unless he sheltered a submerged envy. He looked in himself for envy and could find none. He went on to Adam's dream of a garden like Eden and to Adam's adoration of Cathy. Nothing there unless, 
unless his secret mind brooded over his own healed loss. But that was so long ago he had forgotten the pain. The memory was mellow and warm and comfortable now that it was all over. His loins and his thighs had forgotten hunger. As he rode through the light and dark of, sh of tree shade and opened his mind, moved on. When had the Welsh rat started crawling in his chest? He found it then, and it was Kathy, pretty, tiny, delicate Kathy. But what about her? She was silent, but many women were silent. What was it? Where had it come from? He remembered that he had felt an Im imminence akin to the one that came to him when he held the water wand and he remembered the shivers when the goose walked over his grave. Now he had pinned it down in time and place in person. It had come at dinner, and it had come from Kathy. He built her face in front of him and studied her wide-set eyes, delicate nostrils, mouth smaller than he liked but sweet, small, firm chin, and back to her eyes. Were they cold? Was it her eyes? He was circling to the point. The eyes of Kathy had no message, no communication of any kind. There was nothing recognizable behind them. They were not human eyes. They reminded him of something. What was it? Some memory, some picture. He strove to find it, and then it came of itself. It rose out of the years complete with all its colors and its cries, its crowded feelings. He saw himself, a very little boy, so small that he had to reach high for his father's hand. He felt the cobbles of London dairy under his feet and the crushing gaiety of the one big city he had seen. A fair it was, with puppet shows and stalls of produce and horses and sheep penned right in the street for sale or trade or auction, and other stalls of bright-colored knick-knackery, desirable, and because his father was gay, almost possessable. And then the people turned like a strong river, and they were carried along a narrow street as though they were chips on a flood tide, pressure at chest and back and the feet keeping up. The narrow street opened out to a square, and against the gray wall of a building there was a high structure of timbers and a noosed rope hanging down. Samuel and his father were pushed and bunted by the water of people, pushed closer and closer. He could hear in his memory ear his father saying, it's no thing for a child, it's no thing for anybody, but less for a child. His father struggled to turn, to force his way back against the flood wave of people. Let us out, please let us out, I have a child here. The wave was faceless and it pushed without passion. Samuel raised his head to look at the structure. A group of dark-clothed, dark-hatted men had climbed up on the high platform, and in their midst was a man with golden hair, dressed in dark trousers and a light blue shirt open at the throat. Samuel and his father were so close that the boy had to raise his head high to see. The golden man seemed to have no arms. He looked out over the crowd and then looked down, looked right at Samuel. The picture was clear, lighted, and perfect. The man's eyes had no depth. They were not like other eyes, not like the eyes of a man. Suddenly, there was quick movement on the platform, and Samuel's father put both his hands on the boy's head so that his palms cupped over the ears and his fingers met behind. The hands forced Samuel's head down and forced his face tight in against his father's black best coat. Struggle as he would, he could not move his head. He could see only a band of light around the edges of his eyes, and only a muffled roar of sound came to his ears through his father's hands. He heard heartbeats in his ears. Then he felt his father's hands and arms grow rigid with set muscles, and against his face he could feel his father's deep caught breathing, and then deep intake of and held breath, and his father's hands trembling. A little more there was to it, and he dug it up and set it before his eyes in the air ahead, the horses, ahead of the horse's head. A worn and battered table at a pub, loud talk and laughter. A pewter mug was in front of his father, and a cup of hot milk sweet and aromatic with sugar and cinnamon, before himself. His father's lips were curiously blue, and there were tears in his father's eyes. I'd never have brought you if I'd known. It's not fit for any man to see, and sure not for a small boy. I didn't see any, Samuel piped. You held my head down. I'm glad of that. What was it? I'll have to tell you. They were killing a bad man. Was it the golden man? 
Yes, it was, and you must put no sorrow on him. He had to be killed. Not once, but many times he did dreadful things, things only a fiend could think of. It's not his hanging sorrows me, but that they make a holiday of it that should be done secretly, in the dark. I saw the golden man. He looked right down at me. For that even more, I thank God he's gone. What did he do? I'll never tell you nightmare things. He had the strangest eyes, the golden man. They put me in mind of a goat's eyes. Drink your sweetie milk and you shall have a stick with ribbons and a long whistle like silver. And the shiny box with a picture into it? That also, so you drink up your sweetie milk and beg no more. There it was, mined out of the dusty past. Doxology was climbing the last rise before the hollow of the home ranch and the big feet stumbled over stones in the roadway. It was the eyes, of course, Samuel thought. Only twice in my life have I seen eyes like that, not like human eyes. And he thought, it's the night and the moon. Now what connection under heaven can there be between the golden man hanged so long ago and the sweet little bearing mother? Liza's right. My imagination will get me a passport to hell one day. Let me dig this nonsense out, else I'll be searching that poor child for evil. This is how we can get trapped. Now think hard and then lose it. Some accident of eye shape and eye color it is. But no, that's not it. It's a look and has no reference to shape or color. Well, why is it a look of evil then? Maybe such a look may have been sometime on a holy face. Now stop this romancing and n never let it trouble again. Ever. He shivered. I'll have to set up a goose fence around my grave, he thought. And Samuel Hamilton resolved to help greatly with the Salinas Valley Eden to make a secret guilt payment for his ugly thoughts. Liza Hamilton, her apple cheeks flaming red, moved like a caged leopard in front of the stove when Samuel came into the kitchen in the morning. The oak wood fire roared up past an open damper to heat the oven for the bread, which lay white and rising in the pans. Liza had been up before dawn. She always was. It was just as sinful to her to lie abed after light as it was to be abroad after dark. There was no possible virtue in either. Only one person in the world could, with impunity and without crime, lie between her crisp iron sheets after dawn, after sunup, even to the far fetches of the morning, and that was her youngest and last-born Joe. Only Tom and Joe lived on the ranch now, and Tom, big and red, already cultivating a fine flowing mustache, sat at the kitchen table with his sleeves rolled down as he had been mannered. Liza poured thick batter from a pitcher onto a soapstone griddle. The hot cakes rose like little hassocks, and small volcanoes formed and erupted on them until they were ready to be turned. A cheerful brown they were, with traces of darker brown, and the kitchen was full of the good sweet smell of them. Samuel came in from the yard where he had been washing himself. His face and beard gleamed with water, and he turned down the sleeves of his blue shirt as he entered the kitchen. Rolled up sleeves at the table were not acceptable to Mrs. Hamilton. They indicated either an ignorance or a flouting of the niceties. I'm late, mother, Samuel said. She did not look around at him. Her spatula moved like a striking snake, and the hot cakes settled their white sides hissing on the soapstone. "'What time was it you came home?' she asked. "'Oh, it was late, late. Must have been near eleven. I didn't look, fearing to waken you.' "'I did not waken,' Liza said grimly, "'and maybe you can find it healthy to rove all night, but the Lord God will do what he sees fit about that.' It was well known that Liza Hamilton and the Lord God had similar convictions on nearly every subject. She turned and reached in a plate of crisp pot cakes lay between Tom's hand. How does the Sanchez place look? she asked. Samuel went to his wife, leaned down from his height and kissed her round red cheek. Good morning, mother. Give me your blessing. Bless you, said Liza automatically. Samuel sat down at the table and said, Bless you, Tom. Well, Mr. Trask is making great changes. He's fitting up the old house to live in. Liza turned sharply from the stove. The one where the cows and pigs have slept for years. Oh, he's ripped out the floors and window casings, all new and new painted. He'll never get the smell of pigs out, Liza said firmly. There's a pungency left by a pig that nothing can wash out or cover up. 
Well, I went inside and looked around, Mother, and I could smell nothing except paint. When the paint dries, you'll smell pig, she said. He's got a garden laid out with spring water running through it, and he set a place apart for flowers, roses, and the like, and some of the bushes are coming clear from Boston. I don't see how the Lord God puts up with such waste, she said grimly. Not that I don't like a rose myself. He said he'd try to root some cuttings for me, Samuel said. Tom finished his hotcakes and stirred his coffee. What kind of a father, or what kind of a man is he, father? Well, I'd like to think he's a fine man. Has a good tongue and a fair mind. He's given to dreaming. Here now the pot black guarding the kettle, Liza interrupted. I know, mother, I know. But have you ever thought that my dreaming takes the place of something I haven't? Mr. Trask has pra practical dreams and the sweet dollars to make them solid. He wants to make a garden of his land, and he will do it, too. What's his wife like? Liza asked. Well, she's very young and very pretty. She's quiet, hardly speaks, but then she's having her first baby soon. I know that, Liza said. What was her name before? I don't know. Well, where did she come from? I don't know. She put his plate of hotcakes in front of him and poured coffee in his cup and refilled Tom's cup. What did you learn then? How does she dress? Why, very nice, pretty, a blue dress and a little coat, pink but tight about the waist. You've an eye for that. Would you say they were made clothes or store-bought? Oh, I think store-bought. You would not know, Liza said firmly. You thought the traveling suit Dessie made to go to San Jose was store-bought. Dessie's the clever love, said Samuel. A needle sings in her hands. Tom said, Dessie's thinking of opening a dressmaking shop in Salinas. She told me, Samuel said. She'd make a great success of it. Salinas, Liza put her hands on her hips. Dessie didn't tell me. I'm afraid we've done bad service to our dearie, Samuel said. Here she wanted to save it for a real tin plate surprise to her mother, and we've leaked it like wheat from a mouse hole sack. She might have told me, said Liza. I don't like surprises. Well, go on. What was she doing? Who? Why, Mrs. Trask, of course. Doing? Why, sitting. Sitting in a chair under an oak tree. Her time's not far. Her hands, Samuel, her hands. What was she doing with her hands? Samuel searched his memory. Nothing, I guess. I remember she had little hands and she held them clasped in her lap. Liza sniffed. Not sewing, not mending, not knitting? No, mother. I don't know that it's a good idea for you to go over there. Riches and idleness, devil's tools, and you've not a very sturdy resistance. Samuel raised his head and laughed with pleasure. Sometimes his wife delighted him, but he could never tell her how. It's only the riches I'll be going there for, Liza. I meant to tell you after breakfast so you could sit down to hear. He wants me to bore four or five wells for him and maybe put windmills in storage tanks. Is it all talk? Is it a windmill turned by water? Will he pay you or will you come back excusing as usual? He'll pay when his crop comes in, she mimicked. He'll pay when his rich uncle dies. It's my experience, Samuel, and should be yours, that if they don't pay presently, they never pay at all. We could buy a valley farm with your promises. Adam Trask will pay, said Samuel. He's well fixed. His father left him a fortune. It's a whole winter of work, mother. We'll lay something by and we'll have a Christmas to scrape the stars. He'll pay 50 cents a foot. And the windmills, mother. I can make everything but the casings right here. I'll need the boys to help. I want to take Tom and Joe. Joe can't go, she said. You know he's too delicate. I thought I might scrape off some of his delicacy. He can starve on delicacy. Joe can't go, she said finally. And who is the run to the ranch while you and Tom are gone? I thought I'd ask George to come back. He doesn't like a clerk's job even if it is in King City. Like it he may not, but he can take a measure of discomfort for eight dollars a week. Mother, Samuel cried, here's our chance to scratch our name in the First National Bank. Don't throw the weight of your tongue in the path of fortune. Please, mother. 
She grumbled to herself all morning over her work while Tom and Samuel went over the boring equipment, sharpened bits, drew sketches of windmills new in design, and measured for timbers and redwood water tanks. In the mid-morning, Joe came out to join them, and he became so fascinated that he asked Samuel to let him go. Samuel said, Offhand, I'd say I'm against it, Joe. Your mother needs you here. But I want to go, Father. And don't forget, next year I'll be going to college in Palo Alto. And that's going away, isn't it? Please let me go. I'll work hard. I'm sure you would if you could come. But I'm against it. And when you talk to your mother about it, I'll thank you let it slip that I'm against it. You might even throw in that I refused you. Joe grinned and Tom laughed out loud. Will you let her persuade you? Tom asked. S Samuel scowled at his sons. I'm a hard opinion man, he said. Once I've set my mind, oxen can't stir me. I've looked at it from all angles and my word is, Joe can't go. You wouldn't want to make a liar of my word, would you? I'll go in and talk to her now, said Joe. Now, son, take it easy, Samuel called after him. Use your head. Let her do most of it. Meanwhile, I'll set my stubborn up. Two days later, the big wagon pulled away, loaded with timbers and tackle. Tom drove four ho horses, and beside him, Samuel and Joe sat swinging their feet. Thanks for joining me for tonight's edition of Booked for the Night. I'll be back tomorrow night with more of East of Eden by John Steinbeck. Until then, thanks for listening, and good night.